We are in Philippians this morning, chapter 2, verse 5. This morning, the title of the message is, The Mind of Christ, Our Example. The last is the third in a th- three-part series of the philosophy of Christian ministry that Paul is laying out for us. The passage really kicked off in chapter 1, in verse 21. Look with me, when Paul says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. When he said that, he was making the statement to the Philippians that my life is in God's hands. There's no worries. I'm not fretting over my life in any way. My life is in God's hands. And, And then he'll go on in verse 27 and tell the Philippians, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Gospel conduct, gospel living, the philosophy of this, how we do this. He'll go on there in the bottom of 27, and he'll encourage them. By doing so, you will stand fast in one spirit. Stand fast in one mind. Striving together. I said that word literally means to be doing it together, hand in hand. To be of one mind and to be of one spirit moving forward together in one motion. He's talking about unity within the passage here and all the way down to where we're going to be this morning, beginning in verse 5. And then he goes on in 28 and he'll say, listen, don't worry about those who persecute you. Because their end, right, is destruction. It's perdition. It's proof of their perdition. Their coming destruction. But for you, it's proof of your salvation. You remember, the Lord said, hey, when they tempt you, when they, when they persecute you, they persecute me. It's really back on me. I'm so grateful that God has such big shoulders, right? And we can put that back. But to know that they're really persecuting him and they're persecuting us for being in him. And then he says on in 29, you see, for to you it's been granted, granted, Granted according to God's grace, his amazing grace, to believe. And not only to believe according to his grace that's been granted to you as a believer, but what's also been granted according to his grace is to suffer for his name's sake. To suffer for Christ. Sometimes we think that when we became Christians that everything was going to be a bed of roses and it was going to be all just easy. And you know, and really God does. He, he makes all things new and he takes many things in our life that were tragic or turn to tragedy because of our sin or our past. God does do a lot of restoring and redeeming in our life, but at the same time, there comes a whole new set of difficulties as a child of God, doesn't it? It is a whole new set of difficulties, and, and this is what he's talking about. It's been granted to you to not only believe, but to suffer. And then he goes on in chapter 2, and he says, therefore, if there's any consolation, it's a rhetorical statement He's really saying, in S, since there is encouragement, since there is consolation, since we have this encouragement of comfort of love, we have comfort in fellowship in the Spirit. We're comforted because of affections and mercies of God. And then he goes on and says, fulfill my joy, Paul says. And here's that word again, by being, right, like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, again, of one mind. We're going back to now being of one spirit, one mind, and striving together. He's just clumping this up. He's talking about unity in the family of God. I'm just going over what we've taught previously And then he says in three, and let nothing, not a little bit, not some of what you do, but he says let nothing. When the Bible says things like nothing and all or things like, I mean, that's what it means. There's no no way to take this other than let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But he says in lowliness, and there's that word again, 
in lowliness of mind. Wow. Lowliness of mind. Please, keep that word, lowliness of mind, in your mind as we continue in our passage this morning. He says, esteeming each other better than ourselves. It's, remember, it's an other-centered gospel. It's an other-centered philosophy of ministry. It's not a me ministry. It's not about me. Jesus said, you want to lose your, gain your life, you lose it. You want to be the first, be the last. Within the gospel, it's, it's backwards theology. It's completely different than the world. If you want to get ahead in the world, you just climb up all the little people, you know? Climbing the ladder of prosperity. I'm going to take it. It's mine. God says, no, you lay your life down. You lose your life, and then you'll gain it. Keep that in mind as we go. And then let each of you look out not only for your own interest, but for the interests or the well-being of those around you, of others. Now, he has been giving us a great demonstration of, really, of the mind of Christ in purpose, if you would. He, he's been laying this out, the mind of Christ, for the sake of unity and ministry. But here now, in verse 5, what does he say? Let's pick up. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Yes, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. First, he's been talking about the philosophy of ministry and Christian mindset and unity, and now we come to the mind of Christ and Christ being our example. He is the supreme example of what Paul is trying to get across. And, and so we come to this passage. Many believe that this is one of the most important passages in all of the New Testament. And you say, really? How, how can that be? The word emptying here, when it says that he emptied himself, the Greek word is kenosos, right? Kenosis. And what that means is emptied. Now some modern day thinkers, liberal thinkers, believe that this statement in this passage believes that Jesus, prior to his incarnation and becoming man and coming to the earth as a child, we just celebrated Christmas, laid aside, he emptied himself of his deity. But he did no such thing. If we look at this, and I'll explain it this morning, he did not empty himself of his deity. He did empty himself of something, but it wasn't his deity this morning. As we look at this, he says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ. Let this attitude. He's making the transition from what he has just been talking about, now making Christ the example. We want to... Now begin to look, not to Paul, not to Philippian church, but to Jesus. In awe, if you would. Paul is drawing our attention to Jesus. High and lifted up. And let this mind, the mind of Christ. Now he will not lay out the complete mind of Christ, but referring to what he's saying here to the Philippians and to the church, he will. He will talk about the mind of Christ in such a way that we are to admire him for the distance this morning that he traveled. 
He's come a long way. He went a long way. This also makes a statement that this mind of Christ is something of our choosing. Of us laying our will, our plans, our pride, of us humiliating and humbling ourselves as children of God. We'll talk some more about this. Do we want to walk with the mind of Christ? So he, he comes off with this encouragement in five. Which was in Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ. How, how can that happen? Apart from being in Christ. You have something that was possessed by God. That now he says... Now, you, it's time for you to possess this. It needs to be in you. Verse 6. Speaking of Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Oh, wow. Again, the statement doesn't say that Jesus laid aside his deity. It says just the opposite. You see, the Greek word here for form, it signifies that form which truly and fully expresses the being, if you would, which is underli it's underlined by. The word means the being equal with God. Just this word alone in the Greek is enough ammunition for those who believe that Jesus emptied himself of his deity in heaven before he came. It's foolish. This is enough ammunition to prove that he was God and he is God. We call him Emmanuel, God with us. 100% God and yet 100% man. And this morning in the, in the past, you might have thought, how could this be? Well, this morning, in this passage, you're going to know how this, is being, how this has come to be. He was in the form of God. Sometimes when we think about a form, we think about a shape, don't we? This is, you know... You know, you know, you're, you know, it's a shape of this. But it's just the opposite. This word is not talking about the shape, but the very essence or being of God. You know, what defines me is not what I look like. What defines you and me is what, who we are. Our identity is not in, in necessarily what we look like. And so too here, this is what's being said in the Greek. Jesus, it says, it says that, that he didn't consider it robbery to be made equal with God. I think a lot of times we, can, we get this confused. Jesus did not cling to the privileges of deity. This is where we start this passage, the emptying part of this passage. How did Jesus, what did Jesus empty himself of? Kenosis, if he didn't empty himself of deity, it starts here. He was in heaven. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that in the beginning was God, right? And the word was God. We know that, that the Son of God was every bit of God, as God in heaven. But what he didn't do is he didn't lay aside his deity and the privileges of deity. See, he, he says here, he didn't count it robbery to be made equal with God. That word, you know what that word means in the Greek? It means he didn't grasp or cling to. So Jesus, when God the Father says, it's time for you to go to heaven, and it's time for you to become a man, and go down and, and, and die for the sins of humanity, Jesus wasn't in heaven going, no, I'm not going. You can't make me go. I'm deity. He's not clinging to that. He, he, had, he had, it wasn't robbery. He, he had no need because he was God. He possessed all the deity. He didn't have to cling to it. He didn't have to grasp onto it. He was God. Therefore, it makes perfect sense that he didn't, he didn't make any, any discrepancy here. He didn't count it or even consider it robbery to make himself equal with God. He possessed all the deity, all the power, all the authority. Think about it. All things that were created, Scripture tells us, 
We're created for him and by him and through him. Prior to the incarnation, before, prior to him becoming that baby in Bethlehem. He did not lay aside that. Rather, what he emptied himself of was taking on a lowly state. As Paula just said, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. In lowliness of mind, esteem others greater than yourself. That, that is so small compared to what we're going to begin to see right now, what Jesus Christ did when he came to earth. He did not consider robbery to be equal with God because he was God. Verse 7, but it says, he made himself of no reputation. No reputation. This is the second way in which he humbled himself and emptied himself. This is what many theologians call the humiliation of Christ. He left heaven's throne and took on the form of humanity. Right? Why? Why? Wait, because, because we were worthy? There was no worth in us. We were all sinners separated from God because of our sin. No, 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 no. This is what's so powerful. You know why he came? Because he loves you. He loves you. His love for you drove him to leave heaven's throne without laying aside his deity, right? And not considering it robbery to be made equal with God and make himself of no reputation. Spurgeon said, this is where God became low. Low, 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 Spurgeon says. God emptied himself and became low. That gives me goosebumps. Right there I stopped, shut my Bible, and I had to worship God. Right there. I had to stop and go, are you kidding me? You've got to be kidding me. He made himself of no reputation, not little reputation, Absolutely no reputation. J. Vernon McGee tries to communicate this thought by saying that, that there were some ants that had creeped into his house and they kept getting into the sink. And he wished that he would communicate to these little ants and say, ants, just go away. I'll put a sugar bowl of water in a dish outside. Just stay outside. Just be obedient. But he couldn't communicate to the ants. The only way for him to do that was to become an ant. Vernon McGee says. And that's impossible. He can't become an ant. And so he had to kill his ants, he said. <laughs> he says, I'm not an ant killer. But I had to kill the ants. He had to go. Something's going. But, but you see, a hundred times more than that, this is what God did. This is what God did. He left heaven's throne outside of time and space, outer space. God exists outside of time and space. You can't find him. He's so far away. And his authority and reign and rule is so high that this makes this distance traveled so amazing. So outside of this world and outside of our thinking. And so it took every bit of his deity to become man and make himself of no reputation. Not clinging to the authority he had in heaven because he, he never lost it. Never lost it. What he laid aside is what he took on. That lowliness. And so he made himself of no reputation. And says, and then he took on the where's that word again? Form. The very essence of a bondservant. God. God. Have you ever been demoted in your life? Right, yeah. How many of you have demoted yourself? 
Doesn't it? Usually you get demoted by somebody else. Somebody says, you're fired, you know. Or somebody says, you know, you're getting a pay. This is it. God demoted himself to a bondservant for you. Made himself of no reputation and became a bondservant. A servant, a doulos. For you and for I. This was his form. This is how he came. This is the mind of Christ that is supposed to be in us. That Paul's talking about. Oh, so good, so deep. He took on the form of a bondservant and came in the likeness. We could throw that word form. If there's an image, he came with the image of a man. He took on flesh. Flesh. I'm going to step outside the box. Who's to say God never had flesh before? God took on flesh so that he might be able to come and, and bridge that gap between his fallen humanity that was unworthy the only worth we have is what God sees in us. He became a man. Again, pushing himself low, 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 and lower some more. This is what he left without laying aside any of the authority, any of the power and deity that he possessed prior to the incarnation. You know, for me, this demonstrates his deity. This demonstrates his love, his compassion. It demonstrates his grace on a whole new level. I couldn't do this. Could you? Nor would I. It took the power and the authority of deity to push himself this low. He became a man. It gets worse. Verse 8. And being found in the appearance of a man, it says he humbled himself and became obedient. How many of us humble ourselves? Usually, like it's being demoted, usually it takes somebody saying, hey, <laughs> pointing out our lack of humility. <laughs> hey, you know, you're not acting very humble right now. Sometimes it's our wife, right, guys? <laughs> you know, you're kind of full of yourself right now, honey. You know, you know, when, you know, when you're young, you know, when you're young and, 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 and you ever been into sports and you do something great, you know, maybe you played softball when you were young and you jacked one over the fence. And then you came back in just thinking you were all that, you know. You did some great thing, you know, and you beat in your chest. And your wife goes, you know, you're not all that great. <laughs> you know, and God always has a way of bringing somebody into your life that will smoke you, that will just show you up, just to keep you humble. Humility. It's a big part of unity, isn't it? It's a big part of the philosophy of Christian ministry. It's a big part of what Paul was saying prior Humble yourselves. This is the mind of Christ. You know, I got a problem with, I, I wasn't raised in church. I came to the Lord at 23 years old or so, I think. <clears throat> and it's been a long time since then. But, but one of the things I've always had a problem with is, is in some churches, religion, that is, it, all, it lifts a man up. You ever been to like, I think it's an Episcopal church, right? And, they, and they've got often like a, a left-hand corner. They've got this thing. It's way up in the air. And this guy comes out in this robe, and, you know. It's like, well, you know, and he's like he's God. That's just the opposite of what Paul's saying. He's saying Christ, in all his deity, took on his form of lowliness. Low, 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 low. He pressed himself down, 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 down to earth. And man wants to lift him up, up. Up, higher and higher. Look at me. 
Humility. He humbled himself. That was a big deal. He didn't need to. And he did so with all that deity. And he did so in obedience. Obedience. What pressed him? What pressed him to be obedient? The will of the Father. The plan of salvation for humanity. Your sin caused God to be pressed low and to become obedient. God, who doesn't need to be obedient to anything. His authority is above everything. I want you to think about the, the vastness, what little we know of God. He's so huge, right? Here he is. It's hard for us to be obedient because we think we're all that in a bag of chips. I don't need to obey you. Isn't that the first thing teenagers say when they're teenagers? I'm 14. I've got to obey you. I'm 14. You know? <laughs> you know? It's just built into our psyche. But God, God, in obedience, he humbled himself unto death. Again, we just keep taking steps lower and lower and lower, don't we? He's low. And he goes even lower. It says in our passage, he suffered a death and the crucifixion. Guys, this is, is it, there's just nothing we can relate to in our world regarding the crucifixion. It was the most humiliating thing on the planet in the time of Christ. Christ could not have experienced any more humiliation. He could have not got any lower. He could have not emptied himself, kenosis, any lower than what he lowered himself there on that cross. This was the climax of what God did for humanity. He pressed himself lower and lower and lower and lower. Are you kidding me? Verse 9. And what does God do? God lifts him up. He lifts him up. <clears throat> Therefore, God also has highly exalted. This word exalt means super exaltation. Extreme exaltation. It doesn't have like, like, hey, you know, he got a pat on the back. You know, he got a brownie button or a little award. You know, this is God the Father's super exaltation. Can I, can I ask you something? <clears throat> now that he's emptied himself and he died and he's resurrected and he's back, he's paid the penalty for the sins of humanity, he's back in heaven. What does Jesus possess that he didn't possess before he left in the, at the beginning of an incarnation when he became a child? What did he possess? It wasn't his deity. It wasn't his authority and power. It was a form of a man. Scripture tells us that we'll be able to put our hands and touch those wounds. I said to you earlier, who's to say that God ever possessed any kind of form or flesh prior to the incarnation? I don't think he did. I don't think he does. What was gained from this was not only exaltation, by, by the whole entire world. This is everything created. Angels, authorities, good and bad. Principalities and powers. Sinners and non-sinners. Everything. Everything created. He's been exalted over and beyond and above. But now, in heaven's throne room, he possesses flesh because of what he did. And will always possess flesh for all eternity. I'm just saying. He's highly exalted him. And he's given him the name. The name above every name. He, he already had the name above every name. 
but there's a sense of, of lordship that he didn't have prior to the incarnation. There is a sense of authority and demonstration of God's work that he didn't, that he has now. In our lives, for us, for us, Christ is a demonstration of God's power. Christ is a demonstration of God's supreme love and authority. For us, he became flesh, that we might know him. Apart from that, you can't know him. The name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. He, he, he just is everybody. Everybody. And he's talking about here at that final judgment. I mean, we have opportunities to humble ourselves and to bow our knee. And this is our act of humility. This is my time to humble myself before a living God. But ultimately, this is what's going to happen. And he's not saying that everybody's going to get saved. He's saying everybody's going to acknowledge. They will humble themselves, they will bend a knee, and they will confess that you are Lord. I'd rather do it now. Amen? I want to live for him now. Every day, in every way. Every knee should bow. Of those, again, in heaven and all over the earth. I said it once. We're talking about saved. We're talking about unsaved. We're talking about angels, principalities, powers, demons. It includes, it's all inclusive here in that verse. You're not going to escape this. And many say this is what's going to be tragic. You're going to carry the knowledge of this for eternity. I, I, you know, so deal with that. And then 11 says that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. God. Guys, listen. If you don't see the Trinity in that, if you don't see the gospel in that, if you don't see the love and adoration and plan of God in this passage, you're deaf and your heart's hard and black like a chunk of coal. It's the truth. God has demonstrated his love for us 